Um, so just a few of the things that have succeeded for us. So this is um, bamboo. In warm climates, you can grow construction grade bamboo. In the UK, you're lucky if it grows much more than that. This is a phyllostatches. It's an edible um, bamboo. All phyllostatches aren't poisonous, they're edible, but there are some that are sweeter than others. And this is really sweet, this one. Um, in the spring, it it, it, you know, it's, it's a clumper, but it sprouts these fabulously fierce spikes out of the ground. And when it gets to about here, we, we cut them and um, you peel them and then literally bamboo shoots. You just cut them and, it, and it's a lovely sweet food that we steam them and eat them. If we miss one of the spikes, you know, and you leave it, you turn your back on it for about five minutes, grown two foot. You've got this huge spike. Um, and then, how much? It's about two inches. It's about two inches a day. <laughs> he keeps me down to earth, this man. Um, but the idea is, uh, so, so we leave it and then it, it grows to maturity and then we, we, we cut them and we dry them, we dry them flat and then we use them for structure in the garden. It adds a kind of slightly exotic feel to the garden to have this little grove. It's totally low maintenance apart from harvesting and it's growing next to uh, Marjorie's plum which is a late fruiting uh, plum and Worcesterberry. Okay, I said something about like it's nice to have a bit of exotic feel so you know we put the odd thing like yucca in and I actually put it in just for the structure and then of course a Spanish friend of mine said but of course we eat the flowers it's traditional um, Spanish um, dish and so here we're, we're growing freestanding fig because the, the whole canopy of the garden has created a microclimate, a golden gauge and, and all sorts of berries. So it's got this lovely variety of, of leaves and, and colours and shapes. Just quickly, there are hundreds of apples. This is uh, an apple called George Cave. It really likes chalk. So many things don't like that very alkaline soil. And the one on the right is a Swiss variety that uh, Jenny L'Oreal recommended. It's called Red Love. And when you cut it, all of the flesh is red inside. The bark's red, the leaves are red in spring. It's really high in antioxidants. You know, people look at our, our forest garden and think, well, you know, why haven't you put trees in the middle? Well, the idea is that the sun crosses the garden on a vertical through most of the seasons. So we have this canopy from low rootstocks right up to the top canopy. And it means that the sun is crossing across and, and is penetrating all the levels of the forest garden. And then next to it is this wildflower meadow. And we grow lots and lots of chalk downland species. And it, there's its habitat. So it's habitat for lizards, um, and slow worms, toads, frogs, all those guys that come along and eat um, slugs in, in the raised bed, no dig garden area uh, and around the trees and in the forest garden. Um, it brings in loads and loads of insect life, so it, it increases pollination, but we don't have a codling moth anywhere in sight. We don't even think about codling moths. It just doesn't exist in our, in our world because all those insects are bringing bats in every evening who are harvesting the insects and, and the birds are coming in, all the, all the insect eating birds are coming in and they're eating the guys that we don't particularly want to um, have too high a population of. So there's a real ecological balance through biodiversity and it means that it's not even an organic garden, it's just totally out of that way of thinking. And of course, we have bees in the garden, so we have this wildflower meadow in the centre and then the bees are already habituated to coming into the garden because we're growing flowering bulbs um, and things like wild garlic. So our flowering season for bees starts 
on warm days from January onwards and goes all the way through to autumn time until the bees are going to sleep. This is one of our favourite trees, which is Nepalese pepper. You, you get quite high when you pick it because it's, quite, it's got this slightly euphoric, intense smell. And um, you eat the, you grind the, the outer shell and you discard the seed. We keep it at about six foot, so we, we prune it. It's got thorns fiercer than, than the fiercest rose bush, so you have to pick it in protective clothing a little bit, thick, thick tweed jacket like a gentleman, um, and gloves. But it is a beautiful tree. It, it, it's got an aesthetic to it, um, and then it has these lovely red berries. It's, it's, it's related, related to, Szechuan. to Szechuan. It's very similar. And it's a very hardy tree. It will tolerate any soil and you can keep it cut back to any size you like. It's, it's very tolerant of anything you can throw at it. Um, just really quickly, um, this is Asian or Nashi pear. Expensive supermarkets sell it. It's a piece of cake to grow. Um, you have to eat it when it's really crisp, otherwise it goes mealy. It makes a really potent wine. Um, and you hardly have to do any work with it. You know, it's, you hardly have to even prune it. And it's got a small spreading habit, so it's good for urban gardens. So there's so much that we can grow. We can, we can grow fig freestanding as long as you've got a microclimate. We, we're growing walnuts, Russian olives, Juneberry and Saskatoons, but on chalk, really unsuccessful. We can't grow quince at all on chalk. We're just experimenting my last attempt with Japanese quince, but all other quinces don't work. I, if you've got a less alkaline soil, you'll probably succeed. And things like the Himala another Himalayan tree, Chinese dogwood, which has got a little green fruit, and it's very beautiful, but we're, it's yet to fruit for us to, for us to say yes it's yummy so in essence you've got tree we, we're designing for greater amounts of light we're designing for microclimates we're designing in as much habitat as possible we're designing in as much biodiversity and we're always looking for the plants that like their niche and what what grows well underneath them. So things like marjoram and comfrey and Nepalese raspberry and wild garlic and wild strawberries as ground layer. Yeah, um, we did an awful lot of experimenting. Um, like we didn't entirely know what we were doing right at the beginning and there weren't any books on uh, temperate climate uh, there weren't any books on temperate climate permaculture available at that time, um, which is why we got round to publishing some, uh, or quite a lot actually. Um, so um, yeah, there were things we did that just simply didn't work. So the bulk of all those trees got planted, I think it was in 1995, 96, um, and some things didn't work. And some things we planted almonds because Martin Crawford back then thought the climate might have changed enough for, for, for the climate in uh, southern England to be good enough for almonds. Um, Patrick Whitefield said, no, I don't think so. And Patrick <laughs> Whitefield won that one. Um, they, they, the, the almond trees grew but got peach leaf curl and we struggled with them. We got little crops off them from time to time. But in the end, I took that out. I had a pear tree that would, had a lovely shape and looked gorgeous, <coughs> but it never produced any fruit. And then after 15 years, it produced a massive amount of fruit, and it was disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> so that came out. <laughs> and something else went in, which is just as well, because Maddie keeps finding new trees that she wants to grow. So, <laughs> so there are some trees that have been there since 1995, or whenever it was. And, well, most of them have, actually, probably 70 or more percent. Um, but there are other things that have, have outlived their usefulness, were never really that useful, or just outright failures. And so we've got lots of different um, ages of, of trees. Um, but bit by bit by bit, you know, we're eventually, we are finally sort of getting to the point where most of what is there 
is what wants to be there. So if, you, if you're going to do a, a forest garden, then don't be afraid to experiment. Yeah.